The story had held us, round the fire, sufficiently breathless, but except the obvious remark that it was gruesome, as, on Christmas Eve in an old house, a strange tale should essentially be. I remember no comment uttered till somebody happened to say that it was the only case he had met in which such a visitation had fallen on a child. The case, I may mention, was that of an apparition in just such an old house as had gathered us for the occasion, an appearance of a dreadful kind to a little boy sleeping in the room with his mother. That was a quote from The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. Our next book and bitch read. Oh, we're spooky. Very spooky. Ooh. Was that the first quote in the book? Mm -hmm. I love it. Isn't it a good it's setup? It's a really good setup. I remember reading that and I was like, damn, all right. We're, this is what we're talking about. Yep. Immediately. Ghosts, Christmas <laughs> Eve. You know what I find really interesting? That they set it on Christmas Eve. Um, that sounds very familiar. The ghost of uh, Christmas past? Yes. Of uh, the ghost of ghosts. Of all the ghosts. <laughs> Hi, this is Book and Bitch. <laughs> I was about to say, I guess we should introduce ourselves. <laughs> well, this is Book and Bitch, your friendly neighborhood ghost book podcast. Ghosty book podcast. <laughs> Ghosty book podcast. I'm Jenny Kubel. And I'm here with my host. It's me, Raven Welch. Hi. What's up? Hey, We're well. going spooky again. Yes. It isn't October anymore, but technically... November 1st is all... Hallows. Saints. Yes. All Saints Day. Yeah, but this is November 4th, unfortunately. I think. Holy shit. What day is it? No, it's not November 4th. I think it is November. What day is it? I know. <laughs> I was just thinking of it's November 7th. November 7th. Oh. <laughs> Fuck. All well, Saints Day was a, a while ago. A couple of days fine. ago. Well, Halloween was a week ago. Like we said in our last episode, next year, we're going to make it happen. Let's see, actually. What day is uh, October 31st in 2020? It's a Saturday. Perfect. Yeah, that works with our schedule. We'll just, we'll just do it a little early. <laughs> That's exciting that it's a Saturday. It's usually never a Saturday. I know. Ooh. All the kids out there for trick-or-treating are going to be so excited. Oh All the adults that want to get drunk are going to be super excited. Which is me every day. Yeah. I am Halloween on a Saturday. That's <laughs> my brand. Halloween. <laughs> Halloween all year round. All year. Um. Hi. Yes. So, Book of Bitch Podcast. That's what we are. And uh, you can follow us on social media let's just get this shit out of the way yep. so we can get on with good with turning the screw with turning the screw not oh. taming of the shrew which i oh. got confused i don't know why also a good I book almost, or play sorry i know i almost bought oh. <laughs> the, <Taming laughs> of the shrew and you're like william shakespeare that's I, yeah that's exactly right <laughs> and it was this. really i think it was like really expensive on audible i was like fuck well this is like twenty dollars wait 20 it might not be twenty dollars oh, i could be exaggerating like, damn audible I'll yeah read it i'll read it for free for you <laughs> i'll do it right now for free but uh yeah no not taming of the shrew turning the turn of the screw yes god it's it's so hard uh uh like frankenstein's penis uh, <laughs> or like it's or maybe not, not. <laughs> yeah we don't know we don't know how it works um but uh find us on social media at <laughs> book and bitch pod uh or on our website www.bookandbitch.com yep and where can they find you on social media they can find me and my own little raven coop at Raven underscore Coop. <laughs> I was like, did you change your handle? Does it have little in it? <laughs> no, I wish. Actually, that would be kind of cute. Little Raven? Yes, Aww. little Raven Coop. Uh, Raven underscore Coop or co-op, however you want to say it. You can also find me at co-op the podcast uh, where I create a podcast with my husband where we talk about things. Um, yeah, we just talk about things, whatever. Um, it's and great. You should listen. Yeah, and I think maybe the last episode of Apotheosis on Scraticus Academy has happened, so find us on YouTube um, and go watch them all over again and watch me be cute because I'm adorable. Oh, yeah. You know, whatever. Uh, Ginny, where could they find you on the social media? They can find me on the Twitter and the Instagram at glcubel underscore writes. 
W-R-I-T-E-S. Yes. Yep. And that's all yep. we're going to say on the matter. Yes. <laughs> Go listen to our last episode to find out why. Yes. <laughs> I refuse. <laughs> this, is a good, so uh, this is a good teaser to get people to go back and listen to the Please. last episode. Well, the Frankenstein episode was amazing. We just got finished recording it. And it's amazing because we talk about penises. We talk about hearts. Grave banging. Grave banging. Mm -hmm. I love the term, the term grave banging. Bangin'. <laughs> yep. You can use it. I'll give yes. that one to you. I love it. Free of charge. Perfect. Um, so yeah, let's just kind of hop in. We're talking about, uh, like we said, The Turn of the Screw, which is a horror film or horror novel. Yep. Um, uh, I think it's really interesting because The Haunting of Hill House, which is a, sh a Shirley Jackson novel, um, was turned into a TV show by Netflix. Um, they're using The Turn of the Screw as the general idea and plot for their next season which i think is coming out in 2020 or 2021 i don't know i'm yeah. not a producer i know Netflix. they just announced it in february of 2019 yes. i don't know how long it takes after they announce me neither but i do want to go back and watch the haunting of hill house i'm excited that the we're we're like so two good. days away from october once october first hits i'm like don't call oh. me. I'm I'm watching scary stuff. <laughs> I'm busy watching witches. Exactly. And ghosts. And ghosts. And uh scream. Just scream. Just a scream Just franchise scream. like All over and over and over again. Yes. All right. So let's get started. All right. Let's jump right on in. We'll do a little biography on Henry James. Yes. He was born on April 15th, 1843. Um he was born in America, but moved to Britain later on. So he's regarded as an American slash British author. Mm. And he is regarded as a transitional figure between literary realism and literary modernism. Interesting. Now, if you're not familiar with literary realism, it is very literal. <laughs> they yes. depict everyday occurrences exactly as how they occur. They that sounds to, so interesting. I know, right? They don't try to romanticize Ugh. or stylize. It just is what it is. Um, good examples. Mark Twain, Stephen Crane. Think Huck Finn when you think literary realism. Yeah. Although that has a lot of humor to it. But but Mark Twain was like a funny dude. He was hilarious. <laughs> he's a funny dude, you <laughs> he know. Is, he's I just really looked out with him the other day. He was he's so funny. hilarious. God, has me cracking up. Oh, love him. So... Yeah. So you got literary realism on one side, and then on the other side, you've got literary modernism, which is characterized by a conscious break with traditional ways of writing. So you're thinking Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, E.E. E. Cummings, Marcel Proust, Virginia Woolf, Wallace Stevens. I can go on and on and she, on. She really could. <laughs> yes. She won't stop. I know the modernists are actually <laughs> my favorite. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. When I was in college, I <laughs> begged one of my professors to create an independent study for me so I could just read modernist oh, poets. Oh, <laughs> my God. Your professor yes. was probably like, yes, if you'll get yeah. out of my office hours. <laughs> I know. Well, it was with him. So I was back in his office. <laughs> hours the Tuesday. whole day. <laughs> he was probably like, God damn it. Would you just go? No, he loved you or else he, he wouldn't have made it. That's true he probably would have been like no i'm way too busy for that. i'm sorry i just have way too much going on yeah so anyway enough about my love of the modernist but henry james is considered you know kind of the transition between that a little bit of realism a little bit of modernism um one important thing about modernism they reject absolute truths which okay this was the time no when did they start doing more like medium readings? Like, was it around this time? This would be very, very near that time. I and believe. that's like modern. I, I relate that to modernism as well because that's not an absolute truth. Like, yeah. where people were trying to find other ideas for stuff that was going on. I mean, where yeah. else could my husband be aside from his grave and dead? <laughs> <He's> <laughs> Can we talk the, to him? In the ether. I'll yes. Say. Exactly. Yes, it's also um, a big part of modernism, too, is um, it came freshly off the waves of World War One, and mm. nobody had ever seen warfare like this at yeah. that time. And so people were just stunned. They were reeling from it. They were trying to come back from the damage. And you get a lot of um, philosophical movements happening, like existentialism and, you know, Nietzsche's God is dead. So, yep. 
You get a lot of uh, people feeling very ambiguous at the moment, not knowing what the order of things are, what's going on. It's kind of chaotic during this time. Yep. Yep. So you'll see see how that comes into play later. Yes. But anyway, so Henry James was born. Um, He's actually born into a fairly famous family. His brother, William James, is called the father of American psychology. Never heard of him. No? Okay, never mind. I was like waiting. I was like sitting here and I was like. Yeah, you know, finishing. right? I was like, if they didn't talk about it in uh, psychology in uh, Frasier, I probably don't oh, know Oh, no. <laughs> That's all I have. Probably before his time. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, he created theory of radical empiricism, which um, just to kind of generalize, is that the mind of the observer and the act of observation affect the empirical evidence of truth so your mind and the actual thing that is happening are two separate things a hundred percent and not an absolute truth i believe this yep yeah so you can see how that uh also reflects (laughs) into this goddamn book yep (laughs) jeez i pulled it out for a reason i promise i love it I gotta do more author research. It's I'm like, so interesting. I'm more interested in Mary Shelley having sex on top of her mother's grave <laughs> to fig- then to figure out who Lord Byron is. And I'm like, okay, here you go. Here's all. Let of, me pull out quotes. Here's all of the literary uh, back knowledge. Yes. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, so Henry James, he was known for publishing tons of articles and books. He has um, pieces on criticism, travel, biography, autobiography. He has plays. Um, he relocated to Europe when he was a young man, settled in England. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming because he spoke English. and that was They do that easy. there. <laughs> that was yes. probably easy. <laughs> um, he became a British subject in 1915, one year before his death. <laughs> So he lived most of his life in England, but wasn't a British citizen. Oh, geez. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's kind of sad. Yeah. Um, he was given the Order of Merit, though. Nice. And he was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1911, 1912, and 1916. Ooh, jeez. I know, right? He's uh, racking up the Nobel racking Prizes. Up. His novella... They call it a novella because it's only like 80 pages. Yeah, it's like a Mice and Men is technically a novella, right? Yeah, that's, oh, what, maybe like 112 pages Very or something? Small. Very, Very small. slim. Yes. But it has garnered the reputation as the most analyzed and ambiguous ghost story in English history. I did read that. Yeah. <laughs> I read that while I was, I don't know. Why I was doing research. Googling a uh, turn of the screw. Yes. <laughs> the yep. taming of the shrew. And then I was like, fuck, this is wrong. <laughs> You're Let's like, go this back. is wrong. I don't want No, uh, why are they talking about I don't William want sassy women that don't want to get married. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, want... I do want that. Yeah. But, but not, not for right this now. particular one. Yes. But he is regarded as the master of ghost stories, Ooh. especially for this book. And the turn of the screw has been called the most claustrophobic book in literature. Because it is so small, but so compact yeah. with ambiguity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then he died in February of 1916. And then he just died. And then died. he was a ghost. And then he became a ghost. <sighs> and then he became death. I, yep. So Henry James, I didn't, I didn't find too many crazy things on his life. He didn't have sex on top of his mother's grave. Not that I could find. Unfortunate. You you don't know though. You never know. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Depends on where they're having sex. I feel like on top of a grave at some point you like you, maybe you crave a mausoleum. Maybe you just mausoleum need... would be cool as hell. Yeah, all that marble. You definitely you get a lot Br- more privacy. Bring a rug though. Marble's cold. It is cold. You just bring like a little heater. Oh, a little space heater. A little space heater. Anyways. Henry yeah. James, interesting. Yeah, he's kind of a cool dude. Yeah, he is pretty cool. Yeah. But all right, well, enough about Henry. Get out of here, Henry. I'll get into the synopsis, and then we can discuss. We will discuss. All right. So the turn of the screw. Um, the name. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <Are> you... I'm like, <laughs> I can't Are you believe taming of the shrew. Of the shrew? <laughs> yeah. Cat. Wouldn't it have been hilarious if I you know actually what? just read the taming of the shrew? And I'm great. like, this isn't spooky actually, at all actually we should read it and then we, we should. should watch 10 things i hate about you is that actually are they the same yep cat 
Oh, Katarina. shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Heath Ledger. I love Heath Ledger. I know, right? I love that movie. We've talked about this movie before. And I have never read The Taming of the Shrew. Yeah. I will tell you guys, I haven't read most books. But I will You have that. seen the movie. I have seen 10 Things I Hate About You, yes. Yeah. It's so good. And I love modern uh, um, adaptations because obviously Clueless is amazing. And I believe... Hold on. I'm going to check this real quick. Okay, okay, okay. She's checking. She's checking. Yep, Elizabeth Taylor played Cat in the original film, The Taming of the Shrew, or the nineteen sixty seven version. Nice, yeah. Elizabeth Taylor. I know she's so pretty. She and is she's really so pretty. mean in it. I love it. Ugh. and I do love. Um, I forget what the how- actress's name is. Oh Look yeah, how fucking crazy she's, she looks. I love it. I love it. Yes, Elizabeth okay. Taylor. I didn't think ten things I hate about. Anyways, we're talking about the turn of the screw. <laughs> Turn of the screw. Well, the name comes from um, the idea. Well, I'm not sure it comes from this, but um, it's reminiscent of the torture chambers because oh. you turn the screw bit by bit and it gets worse and the worse. longer you turn. So the idea was building up this anticipation in the ghost story because as you get further along, it gets worse, worse and, and worse. worse and worse. And you're just holding your breath, waiting for it to. And, and, and in the beginning of the story, too, they talk about there was one child and that was worse because it they, and it turned the screw. And then it's like, oh, but there's actually two. Now there's and a second one. And then that's even worse. <laughs> and it, it just keeps going. Yeah, exactly. Anyways, continue. So what happens is um, very similar. Oh, I forgot to bring this up in our Mary Shelley podcast, but very similar to Frankenstein. Um, the story is written in a frame narrative. Yes. So it's a story within a story. Um, in Shelley's case, a story within a story, story within a story. Yeah. <laughs> but this one's just a story within a story. Mm-hmm. Um, it starts out on Christmas Eve with an unnamed narrator who is gathered at an unnamed house with mostly unnamed, unnamed guests. People. Yep. <laughs> and they're having a party. And a man there named Douglas says that he has a manuscript that was written by his sister's governess in which she recounts a tale of seeing ghosts at her previous employer. Um, he refers to her as most agreeable. He loves her. He Yes, it is hinted that he was in love with her and how he became in possession of this manuscript. Right. Um, it's interesting that he refers to her as agreeable, though, because it automatically sets you up to believe that the manuscript is reliable. It's 100% reliable. Also, um, I, this is getting kind of off track, but we'll talk she's about it, described <laughs> too a lot as like being very beautiful, being very intelligent. How does that affect how you see a narrator? Yep. Anyways, go on. So he's reading from this manuscript, and at that point, it switches to the governess' point of view. Um, she's the daughter of a parson, and she agrees to work as a governess for this wealthy and attractive man who has come into guardianship of his sister's orphaned children. Um, He makes it very clear from the get-go that he does not want the children. He does not want anything to do with the children. He wants the governess to take sole charge of them Mm -hmm. and not bother him with anything. Yes. So she agrees to take this position. Um, It's hinted that she takes it because she is attracted to the uncle of the children, this gentleman. Yes. And that um, she's taking it as a way to get closer to him. Right. And we'll discuss this later, too. <laughs> right. Which it's like, you want nothing to do with these children? Yeah. Okay, I'm, I want to be close to I'm you. I'm immensely attracted to you now. <laughs> yes. Um, so Neglect she... me, Yo. daddy. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> so she agrees to take this position, and she goes out to his secluded country house, Bly? I never Bly, did. yeah. Bly, I never Bly did Manor or whatever. Is yeah. that what it's called? Bly Manor. I, yeah, I didn't listen to the audible of this one, so I actually have no idea how it's pronounced. Oh, it's I think Bly. Bly. Yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. thank you. Bly yes. Manor. She she knows I had to listen to it. <laughs> That's why I looked at Raven. Audible. I was like, I don't know how it's pronounced. Raven, Raven. You, you listen to this. <laughs> yes. So she goes out to the secluded country house, Bly. Um, there's two children there, a little girl, Flora. Which and I love the name Flora. It is really cute. So cute. It makes me think of the uh, good fairies in Sleeping Beauty. As, oh yeah, yeah. yeah Flora, Flora, fauna, and I never remember the last oh, one. Something with an F. Fucker. Fucker. <laughs> Disney just. Thought, <laughs> That's my very old, name. Old school Disney. <laughs> yeah, man, they were ruthless back then. They were. Yeah. Um, 
Flora so, and Miles. Flora and Miles. Miles oh, a little shit. I just realized Miles is the name of my sister's dog, who is also kind of a little shit. Oh. oh the name Miles And he's is like cursed. a black lab, which <laughs> I see a like lab. a black soul of Miles. <laughs> Miles. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the name. It's possessed. Yes. Um, Your but, sister's fine. I know. I'll be like, eh, it's going to see ghost. Yep. <laughs> um, so Flora is there already when the governess arrives. Governess is unnamed. I, it's not that I don't know her name. And we just want to refer yeah, to her as her just, position, which yeah. we could also talk about at some point. Yep. Yep. Um, so Flora's there already. Miles is away at school. And then he comes back later on. For like summer. For summer. With a note saying he's been expelled. <laughs> okay. Don't come back. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> exactly. Um, the note does not say why he was expelled. Mm-hmm. Um, and the governess is too afraid to inquire further, basically. She doesn't want to cause a scene. Yeah. She eventually, I mean, she's, she eventually is kind of like, he's so amazing. Why would why somebody even, ex- ugh. Yeah. <laughs> we we'll get into that, that <laughs> weird fucking relationship. Ugh. Yeah. So she's here with these two children and she begins to see figures of a man and a woman that she doesn't recognize as part of the estate. They're kind of just walking around. They're in towers. She just sees them fleetingly. Mm -hmm. Um, Eventually she learns from Mrs. Grouse um, that the figures look... Mrs. Grouse doesn't see the figures, but she says that the way the governess is describing them, they sound like Miss Jessel and Peter Quint who were former employees of the estate. Yeah. Miss Jessel was a former governess. She was the governess. And then Peter... What? Peter Quint? Yeah, Peter Quint. I don't know why I was going to say Peter Quill, which is the name (laughs) of the character in Guardians of the Galaxy. Anyway, sorry. Um, What was he? Was he like their driver or housekeeper? Yeah, I think he was like... uh, I think he worked in the stables, maybe. I'll have to look that up, folks. No. Yeah. Yeah. Peter Quint. He worked there. Yes. Um, and it was hinted that they were having some sort of sexual, sexual yeah, relationship, illicit relationship. Mm-hmm. And they um, were both very close with the children. Yes. They spent a lot of time with the children, which many, many of the articles that I read about this book have said that saying that they were close to the children was the Victorian equivalent of politely saying that they were sexually abusing the children. No! Yes. Oh, God. Did that just change the book for you? Yes! Yeah. Oh, my God, this is way more horrifying. Yep. I just thought of it as, like, honestly, the way that I kind of pictured their relationship with the children was that of, like, surrogate weird parents. surrogate parents where they're like way too close but now i'm like they were way way too close. way way too close yeah Oof, that, uh, i mean don't like it's not proven anywhere it's just a lot of people have read it and said that's kind of like the polite victorian well, and, way of saying it <laughs> yeah and then mrs gross tells you like they were sent away yes which for uh. probable reasons. <laughs> for being way too close. Yes. So, but they're both dead now. Both yep. Miss Jessel and Peter Quint are dead. And apparently roaming around the house. Or the grounds. Well, from what the governess sees. Yes, exactly. Um, so she's dealing with that. <laughs> she's dealing with a lot right yeah, now. <laughs> she's got a lot of things on a her plate. A lot of things going on. So she's... Um, Basically trying to take both these children and be a mother, a father, and a teacher to them, essentially. Because the uncle's hardly ever there. They're orphaned, obviously. And now Miles is kicked out of school. So she's trying to take on all these roles. She's, from what we can gather, young, inexperienced. She has no life... What what am I trying to say? Life experiences outside of her father's... Right, to play the part of a parent. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So... Later in the book, um, Flora leaves the house without permission. It's like at night. Yes. And it's spooky. It is spooky. It's spooky. I love it. Um, and then the governess is obviously panicked because yes. she just lost one half, one of, half of her charge. <laughs> yeah. So they're searching all over and they finally find her by the lake. And the governess is dead set that she is talking to the ghost of Miss Jessel. Yeah, she sees, like, a big black figure. Yes. And then, yes. 
So she is convinced, and she's trying to get Flora to say, I saw Miss Jessel, or I was talking to Miss Jessel. Mm -hmm. But Flora won't. Yeah, and between um, the time when, like, Miles comes back and, like, this situation, Mm -hmm. she believes that she sees them she that they see That's, the ghost yes thank you i've they, skipped over that part right but yes, that, she believes the children are communicating with, with the, ghosts. the ghosts and they're they're having this relationship with them and sorry if i'm like jumping ahead no, but good. is this that that part where she's at the lake is after when miles and flora like trick her into miles being able to go outside like it's like these kids play this weird manipulation game Mm -hmm. with the governess too where i'm like these people are like the fucking weirdest yep weirdest fucking children just get rid of them yep send them back (laughs) send them all away send them back yeah that's actually one of my talking points yeah no how weird the children are they're so fucking weird oh and yeah and so i feel i mean like the governess thinks that the kids are being taken advantage of and taken over by these ghosts. Yep. And then they're just going off and they're like, well, I'm trying to do this for attention. Yep. <laughs> they're just Anyways. being, I don't even, uh, we could talk about it more about. Oh, we should. But so yeah. I'm trying she, to think of the best way to describe it. But yeah, so. She's at the lake. She sees Miss Jessel. Yep. She believes. Yep. And she's convinced that Flora is talking with her. Um, She tries to get Flora to say that and she won't. Finally, she basically like, coheres it out of her yeah and flora is so traumatized from the event that she says she doesn't want to see the governess anymore right and they make arrangements to send flora away yeah so was that ripley <laughs> that was ripley <laughs> oh ripley <laughs> oh buddy she just made a little pitter patter across the you might oh my gosh oh i wonder if like i mean she might be so one thing that she likes to do she likes to chase parker around Aww, and they'll go up like... and down the stairs. Yeah. Aww. Quiet Ripley down. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet your ass down. All right. All right. Um, yeah. And yeah. so they send Flora away. Does, they, does she send, do they send Flora to her uncle? Yes, they do. Okay. And then the governess is left alone with Miles. And this is very near the end of the book, so I won't, I won't go into what happens here. But... Almost the same instance. She tries to get Miles to confess or to reveal that he is talking to the ghost of Peter Quint. And, and then, then things happen. And then we won't tell you what happens after that. Yes. And you have to read the shortest book of all time. It is very short. Very short. Very short, but very good. Very good. All right. Let's get in it. All right. Well, should we start with the big question? Yeah. The question of what this whole thing is about? Yeah. Are the ghosts real, or is the governess mad? Okay. Oh, fuck. I can't talk about the <laughs> ending. Because so the ending makes you think that maybe they were real, but then if she's the, mad, then... The ending made me think she was crazy. I know. I thought the ghosts were real all the way up until the ending, and then I was like, no, she's just... She's a lunatic. She's crazy. She's just crazy. Yeah, no. Um, I would probably have to say I don't think that they are real like the fact that no one corroborates their story not even Flora who like the children are like Flora's like how old eight yeah and Miles is 10 yeah which he is I, mean, I think so Hold yeah on. he's super creepy but um <laughs> Good old like Miles. Flora doesn't even like yeah eight like ten. she completely denies it and you would think I mean a child of her age would maybe not lie at to that capacity but i mean i don't know they're creepy kids they they're weirdos i feel like you'd have to have a motive if i was an eight-year-old child and i saw a ghost i'd be like hell yes i saw the ghost yeah (laughs) get me out of here yeah and like why is she out at the lake by herself if she doesn't see a ghost i don't know creepy children it's definitely the weirdest part of the book is like just trying to figure out like does she actually see anybody yes or is it all a figment of her imagination which could be induced by stress because she's having to deal with all this other shit yep Uh, a lot of critics have pointed out that it's very apparent that this governess is very young that she's had no life experience her father is a parson she came from a very religious household Mm -hmm. so now she's in this secluded place with 
really no one. She just has Mrs. Grouse, and Mrs. Grouse isn't that interested in, you know, being friends with her. No. Until kind of towards the end, but then she's also, like, you're kind of crazy. Yeah, it's kind of like a, she's trying to manage, Mrs. Grouse is trying to manage the situation, and she, poor Mrs. Grouse. I know, she's like, what the fuck is going on? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so a lot of people have pointed that out, that it could be very similar to, Similar in a way to um, Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey. Yeah. Where the young female protagonist is very imaginative, very intelligent, but she uses that in a way that's almost to her detriment by conjuring up all these things that aren't happening. Right, exactly. And I do think that a lot of writers during this time kind of make that as a kind of trope that you can kind of pull on where it's like, you're so smart women aren't normally smart so that's why you're having all these issues you yeah just don't it's know like what to do with they're your big not brain. it's obviously not real and you're probably just crazy she reads too many books and, yep. and now they've yep. exactly yeah um, so a lot of other people have also pointed out because this is a very popular theme in uh, victorian literature is that it could be repressed sexual jesus feelings. christ <laughs> wow yep A lot of people have said that perhaps the governess is crazy because she feels sexually frustrated at not being at the rejection of the her employer. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I mean enough that you would conjure a ghost. Yeah, I feel like I would be pissed, but I'd be like looking for ways to get out of this employment. Not well. Here's the other thing, though, is so Miles and Flora. I think that what they're trying to do and trying to manipulate the situation is trying to get their uncle to come see them. Because that's, like, something yeah. they kind of ask for. Like, are the ghosts a way for the governess to get the uncle to come? Oh, maybe. Like, maybe she's accidentally, like, conjuring those ideas in her mind. Dude, your property is haunted. It's haunted. You need come to come save me. You need to come back here. Yeah, immediately. Or I'm not let us come this. to you. This is not in my contract. No. Banging yeah. might have been. <laughs> but not But this. not ghosts. <laughs> not this. Yeah. So yeah, it's very interesting. Almost every article that I've read, I won't say every article out there, but every article that I read is trying to figure out if the ghosts are real or if they're imaginative. And there's a article from The New Yorker, because if you haven't figured out yet, I really love The New Yorker. She loves it. I do. I love she The New Yorker. Um, but Brad Leithauser... I'm sorry, Brad, if I'm saying your last name wrong. Poor Brad. I know. I'm sorry. (laughs) Wrote this. At Brad. (laughs) At Brad. Wrote this really great article called Even Scarier on the Turn of the Screw. And his kind of um, premise is that attempts to solve the book work towards diminishing the value of the book. Because the value of the book lies in its ambiguity yeah. and lies in kind of this atmosphere that James has created mm-hmm. where you're not sure what's going on and it heightens the anticipation. And when you eventually get to the end of it, you feel maybe like, dissatisfied and rattled. <laughs> yep. yeah. So I thought that was really interesting too. And mm-hmm. it kind of goes hand in hand with. Um, Raymond Chandler from our big sleep episode, who was like, I he don't know what know. the fuck is going on. I'm just creating this atmosphere. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that that is definitely how you should leave it. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I think that that's good writing to kind of go back and say, well, what happened here? Like, l- let me think of my own reasoning behind why I think that this has happened. Like, it's thought provoking and. I think that that makes good literature and that's why this book is so it's been read over it's been adapted so many times so many times television movies operas it was just at the Seattle Opera a few months ago it It was was. why didn't we go I know right damn it I'm always trying to get people to go to the opera I know I want to go to the opera um yeah so I think that that it makes sense I want to know kind of the point behind some of the manipulation of the children of the children yeah because in this very same article by brad our good good friend Brad, friend brad he uh talks about the children's speech patterns and he's like you can't tell from the context that you're reading it in if they're being like cute and charming Uh. or if they're being canny and deceptive 
Yeah, no. And um, I read, I, I listened to it via Audible. Mm-hmm. And the way that they portray the children talking is just that. They sound really innocent, but mm-hmm. you're like, there's something so sinister behind what they're saying. It's so innocent, but it can't be oh, true. Yeah. And it just makes it a lot creepier. So where I... I don't see the ghost, quote unquote, mm-hmm. as your villain. I see the children as your yep. villain in the story. And they're the ones who are perpetuating her um, her agony, her I hysteria. guess. hysteria. Yeah, exactly. They're the ones that are making it worse and yeah. honestly causing it. Because they're the ones who are trying to trick her and manip- manipulate her. And they're yep. creepy fucking kids they are and the voiceover for them well at least for miles flora doesn't talk all that much no she doesn't have too many lines no but miles though he I, is a talker he's a talker he creeped me out and i honestly i could not figure out his age because at some points like i thought he was like a teenager because he, he's so manipulative and he's very mature in the way he talks. So. Exactly. Or maybe I'm imagining that 10-year-olds are not as mature as they are. I know. But also, like, I at some points I thought he was younger than 10. Because mm. of how innocent he acted. Yeah. But he's not. But he's not because he's creepy. Yeah. Yeah, there's one particular line from Flora, too, that they pull out as an example. And she says to the governess at one point, I don't like to frighten you. And they're like, well, wait, does she mean it as, like, a nicety? Like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't want to frighten you. Or does she mean it as a threat? Like, I don't want to frighten you, but... I'll but I will a, if I'll I have to. I'll stab you in your sleep. I'll, I'll <laughs> fucking stab you. Yeah. <laughs> no, Flora! Yeah. <laughs> Sweet baby Flora. <laughs> Ugh, yeah, no, like, Miles has lines like that, too, where he's, yep. like, she's... The governess is trying not to give him more Mm -hmm. and he ends up getting it out of her anyways yep because he's fucking creepy yep but she never describes them as manipulative or creepy no she she talks about how much she loves them and how they're good good and how they're beautiful and charming and she can't figure out why miles would be expelled i was so creeped out by their relationship i was like is this how governesses are because i see when i think governess i think jane Eyre, who i think is void of emotions except for wanting them (laughs) like wanting love i don't know like she's just well clean and she is what do i want to say she's attached to her charge and she likes her charge but she's not like over the top affectionate right whereas like she's like the governess in the turn of the screw is like giving them smooches like, she's yeah. kissing them. I'm like, I don't... Haven't these children been through enough? Yeah. <laughs> they don't need you smooching them. Yeah. But, I mean, in the whole idea that maybe there was, like, some sort of sexual abuse makes it a lot more sinister. Yeah. Their relationship with her and how they act with her mm-hmm. and how they act in general. Because probably they're, they're little sociopaths and they're probably going to kill somebody. Be. That's how it starts. Yep. A little bit of sexual abuse here. Some neglect. Some ghosts. Some parent deaths. They had two. They had two. They're probably serial killers. Yep, they might be. At this point, yes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's so creepy. No, yeah, I remember, like, wanting to message you, and I'm like, is this how governesses act? Like, is this really how people act with because I used to work in a school like my parents are teachers and stuff and I know that this is different but coming from a family of educators and then having like my best friend Courtney used to work Mm -hmm. in like a daycare like most of the time you're like get the fuck away from me I want Mm -hmm. I don't want anything to do with you at the end of the day yeah I would so I worked as an au pair for six months which I guess is the modern you're a modern governess (laughs) governess. Um, and the two little boys that I was in charge of. They were kind of demons, to be honest. Were you giving them smooches, though? <laughs> I was not giving them smooches. I mean, they would, like, sit in my lap and I would read them stories. But, you know, it wasn't anything crazy. Sinister. It wasn't sinister. <laughs> we lived, read little books in French. It was cute. Oh, that does sound really sweet. Yeah. But now it also has sinister well, no! understanding. Okay, well, no. <laughs> uh, I can't look at it anymore. Yeah, I had no it, idea. I didn't have any clue that people well, oh, took it as. I didn't pick that up. I read about it because that was not my 
initial. I th- yeah, I thought the relationship was creepy, but I took it as like Miss Jessel and Peter Quint were like surrogate parents because the uncle's never there. Right, exactly. And then now when I'm like kind of thinking about her relationship, because I also didn't see her as being, well, maybe I did kind of think like she was attracted to the uncle, but now her being so attached to the children is mm-hmm. kind of her way of being attached to the uncle. Or getting attention from him. Exactly, because she's taking such good care of them, and she yep. loves them very much, and they're very good boys she's and very, girls. very, attached to them. Yes. Oh, but they're so good. They're so beautiful. Oh, God, it's so yeah, creepy. Yeah, it was creepy. Ugh. So, here's the next question. Yes. How reliable do you think the governess is as I, a narrator? I don't think she's reliable no. at all. I, I thought think she, they make you think that she is really yes, reliable. Yes, I was about to say they set it up with the frame narrative mm-hmm. that she is reliable and this is a true ghost story. Yeah. But if you're on the side of the fence that says, no, she was just crazy. Yeah. Well, and so they like to rely a lot on her. I mean, she's supposed to be really smart. Mm-hmm. They also talk about how beautiful she is. Yeah. And so I'm also like, I take that into account where like maybe Henry James is trying to make you think that she's more reliable because yeah. this, the original narrator or teller of the story sets you up to say she was very good. She's yep. very amiable and I loved her very much. Yes. Yada, yada. She was cool. Yeah. And then they set her up to be trustworthy because mm-hmm. to be honest, this is how they do it in literature. The more attractive your character is, the more yep. good they are. I mean, it's like where the crowd out saying. That was my biggest sticking point with it is I was like, she lived out in the marsh for all these years. Yeah, <laughs> she didn't have a brush. And now she's but the most she's beautiful, beautiful person in the town. And everybody gonna, wants she's them. She's going to get out of her uh, trial. Charges, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just because she's pretty. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, so, and that's why, because we read that book and we talked about that, that's one of the reasons why yep. I brought that up. Because, I yep. mean, I think that that's a way for authors to try to get you to enjoy the character more. Yep. If they're more attractive. Yes. It, so. I agree. It's a way to give her validity. It's because she's pretty. Yep. Exactly. You want to believe her because she's pretty and intelligent and this perfect like person she is yeah she is kind of like a perfect person and she loves these children and she wouldn't obviously be thinking anything other than for their welfare she's trying to protect them throughout the whole story Mm -hmm. she's convinced these ghosts are manipulating them or possessing them yeah i never was very clear on that i definitely got the manipulation in this is just on all fronts yeah (laughs) everybody (laughs) loves to manipulate yes exactly Oh, man. All right, what else? That's so good. Um, She's definitely... um, I can't do that one now because it'll spoil the end. I know. The ending is so... you. I mean, we're not going to talk about it, but you didn't realize what had happened in the ending when we talked about it Mm -hmm. over tacos. Yep. (laughs) Over tacos. Fajitas, technically, Uh, and margaritas the size of our torso. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no. Maybe too much margarita. <laughs> I mean, we didn't think there was such a thing, but but there turns may, out, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, well, one of the other things I had about the turn of the screw is, you know, how much I love talking about literary theory. Yes. Um, it's hailed as a cornerstone of new criticism. So, new criticism yes. emphasizes close reading to um, discover how a work functions as a self-contained aesthetic object. So opposite of what we're doing, where it takes into account cultural context, author backstories, yes. it thinks you should just read a work for what it is. Yeah, which is like not what Ginny is about. No, <laughs> not about it at all. That's Sorry, what guys. I'm about. That's my literary <laughs> theory. I, I believe it all bleeds into the story. <laughs> New criticism, however, does not feel that way. And it particularly does not feel that way about The Turn of the Screw. It thinks you should read the book just for the aesthetic sake of the book. Well, I mean, and that's what I I tend to do. Yeah. I think that's also, that's kind of reflective of my style when we're <laughs> talking about the, like, my episodes, my book choices, and I'm kind of leading the conversation. Yep. I tend to kind of go that in that direction. But when you brought up that his brother was... Uh, A very hit, famous psychologist. Yes, and, like, what exactly he brought up, or <laughs> what that brings to... 
how Henry James told the story, I'm like, well. And you're like, oh, damn I it. Mean, <laughs> but you gotta, like, I, look at that. I know. I just find it very interesting, the idea of no absolute truth and what you're experiencing versus what is happening yeah. are not the same thing. Well, and it kind of makes it really interesting for when you're discussing it with other people because what other mm-hmm. people are seeing might be completely different. And so you might have someone that reads a book and they're like, no, the ghosts are real. You and I are yep. pretty similar in kind of how we're thinking where we're like, nah, she's crazy. <laughs> I just, I think I just really like crazy female protagonists. Yeah. Like, I mean, uh, well, <laughs> Mary Cat is my favorite literary character out there. Yes, <laughs> she's she crazy is. as hell. Yeah, and like, I mean, a lot of the characters that we've explored, if they're a female character, a lot of times they do have some kind of psychosis. Like, yeah. I mean, Kaya, we'll talk about her a little bit. She kind of was, um, maybe should have had a little bit more, uh, if I'm being honest. Delia Owens. Delia Owens. Add a little more crazy than Come on, we need more crazy. I mean, she can't just be beautiful and everybody loves her and then she just gets out of murder charges. Yeah. Um, And then, like, I mean, like, thinking of, like, Victor Frankenstein, too, like, we just like a character that's crazy. Yeah, I think that's becoming our theme. Horror yeah. and crazy. Yeah. They go hand in hand. We should actually, like, with every main character, we should just talk about how crazy they are. Because I think that Philip Marlowe, too. He, um, He's he, so cold that you almost he, wonder if like, he has some kind of who psychosis. Who hurt you, honey? Who Aww, hurt you? <laughs> build up all these walls. Yeah, I think Richard, uh, Richard uh, Mayhew is probably the only normal character he's a uh, very quintessential british yes <laughs> how i like imagine him like he's very hugh grant <laughs> he's very hugh grant and he's also like well these things are just happening to me now yeah. so let's just let's, go with we're it just gonna roll with it yeah exactly which i mean you do you richard you that's, do you that's richard great. mayhew i love richard mayhew yeah. one of my favorite characters oh, anyways but anyways what i particularly like about the idea of radical um experiencism coming in here is when you look at the governess is what actually is happening the same as how she's perceiving it yeah because you're getting it from her it's not like an omnipresent like narrator narrator. yep you're getting it just from her you're literally reading her manuscript or journal or whatever you want to call it exactly that she wrote after the fact too after later you would as you know in true crime it's usually wrong. Yep. <laughs> I was about to say, whenever people have to recount something, it's like 90% wrong. It's also like things like that present them in a more, um, in a better light mm-hmm. at the end of the day. So the fact that we're, we're debating, oh, is she crazy or did this actually happen after the fact where she is telling the story and she's making herself sound better. Yeah, she just, could- I mean, you would just do that. Naturally, yeah. you leave parts out, you adjust things to make yourself seem not as crazy. <laughs> yeah. And we're still like, she's Oh, like, but she could be crazy. Yeah. She was probably crazy. She's like, These ghosts, they're just here and they're tormenting the children. I don't yes. know what to do. I'm so concerned for them. I'm totally right, though. Yeah. And it's like, mm, Are you? Are you? Mm-hmm. Yes. No. Maybe, maybe not. No, she's crazy. Um, what else? Well, we could talk about uh, all of the forbidden subjects in here. Oh. Like how sex is uh, just kind of glazed over. Well, Good old yeah. Victorians. Yeah. I mean, they, how, well, how, let's, let's talk about sex. Do they <laughs> like about, it back then? Ex- assume, unless it's on top of graves. People were having a lot of affairs, apparently, according to uh, Mary Shelley's biography. Yeah. <laughs> so holy apparently shit. Apparently they like, did. <laughs> everybody was having an affair. Yeah. Or illegitimate children all over the place. Yes. So. I mean, they were also feminists, so. It makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Good old feminist. But yeah, it's interesting. One person had pointed out was the kind of glazing over it strictly because of the era that this book was written in. You know, trying to, what do I want to say, cover it up for the masses so yes. it was more acceptable? <laughs> or was it being used as a technique to be more engaging? then you start when things are ambiguous you start trying to fill in the gaps yourself and you can often make it maybe worse than what is actually right it actually is jesus christ we're the kids yeah see i don't you know. don't know though you don't Nobody know knows. yeah because i like i mean i would one would want to think that is the sec is the latter because 
you want to kind of think that there was some thought put into how obscure it is. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, I mean, it could have been generalized by an editor in general. Like, oh, you can't talk about how these kids were touched. She was like, Henry, what is wrong with you? (laughs) We're just going to cross all this out. Yeah, let's take this back to the drawing board. It's (laughs) it's only 80 pages. This editor just chopped it all out. cut it all out. They're like, like, this is fucked, man. We cannot print this. What is wrong with you? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I mean, that you don't want to think that that's how it affected a book. But that could well, I mean, be. that's a very interesting point, too, is, you know, the editing process in general. Mm-hmm. I mean, things get cleaned up, they get chopped out, things get rearranged, they get dropped. Now, now tell me this. Why didn't the editor do that to Stephen King's It? I know. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my theory. I think Stephen King is being paid by the word. <laughs> he, I think so. And he was like, nope, leave it all in there. It's crucial. Yeah, yeah. it if has you, to happen. If you leave it in there or if you chop it out, I walk. <laughs> I leave. I could see Stephen King just walking for yeah. cutting out that particular scene. Well, he was on coke for most of it. Oh, so yeah. He was, he was probably irate. Like, no, no consequences <laughs> to my yeah. actions. Yep, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh yeah, but that's a very interesting point, too, because even though we oftentimes assume this comes straight from the writer, there are a ton of other people behind the publishing process. And, yeah. I mean, not maybe so much nowadays with our laser printers and whatnot, but with printing presses, mm-hmm. you know, somebody could decide it's way too much work to print this extra page. We're not printing it now. Oh, geez. Yeah, that would kind of suck. Yep. And things get left out. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what all um, examples of that there are, too. Ooh, I don't have any. I'm not going to gonna ask you to like look it up. Right <laughs> my quick. eyes got really wide. I was like, I don't have examples. Yeah, you're like, why did you ask me to do this? No, uh, but I wonder what they would be. I wonder yeah. if you have any like really cool examples of that. Um, I'll find some. Send, well, I'm the audience. Oh, you're talking to the room. I'm talking Sorry, to the listeners. audience. I assume she was talking to me. Well, I mean, you Jenny, can also you go could. find them. <laughs> We could do blog content yeah. on this. But um, if you have any examples of this, audience, uh, mm-hmm. send them to us via yep. Twitter and stuff. I'm not trying to make this our, our it's outro. It's homework. But, but it could be your homework. Send us some uh, really cool examples of books that, if they had been left in their original state, would have yeah. been totally that's a, different. That's a big thing for Shakespeare's plays, too. Oh, yeah. With him... Things were not so much like printed, but they were like hand copied. Mm-hmm. And depending on who was doing the hand copying, they may have been like, well, this line is stupid. I'm not adding it. And then cut somebody's line and alter okay. the play. Yeah, exactly. Also, I think that there was also, I'm getting this from Good Omens because I recently <laughs> watched that and they have Shakespeare in it. And he's like upset because he has to change the play in like some way because his editor or the playhouse or who whomever because i think like they wanted the queen to come and like do uh, one of the plays. And they're like you gotta get this shit this, together for the queen she is not cool with this no you gotta you gotta cut that shit out yeah even though she's probably one of the more chill queen victoria is it queen victoria no elizabeth. no elizabeth thank you and mm-hmm. i think queen elizabeth she was pretty I... she had lead poisoning so she was pretty kind of loopy anyways yeah. I did my entire honors thesis on how I thought Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra was a hidden allegory for uh, James the First succession over Elizabeth the First. Oh my god! I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about this all day. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so Shakespeare did write about Elizabeth a lot. Yes, very much so. So, and probably had to edit a lot because of that. Yes. So yes, 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 yes. Anyways, all right. What else? What do you got for me? Or nothing? Or are uh, we done? Man, I think that was it. I'm mostly... So if you guys couldn't tell, I went all in for like the literary theory on this one because I loved it so much. Yeah. Yeah. She loves it. I she do. loves her literary theory. We're I do. over here. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm just going to keep going back to the reason why I picked Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or the modern Let's... Prometheus was so that I could talk about Mary Shelley having sex on top of her mother's grave. Grave banging. Great thing. We're coining that term. Yes. We should put a TM mark on it. Yes. I'll write it down. I'm putting that on a shirt. <laughs> Submit it to the lawyers. <laughs> We'd like to trademark this. We're trademarking grave banging. That's all us. You heard it here first. Yeah. I'm putting it on a t-shirt like I did. <laughs> Mad, bad, and dangerous to know. Yep. Lord Byron. Yes. T-shirt too. Yeah. But no, overall, this book is, I mean, it's 
a quintessential ghost story. I think it even influenced um, Jackson's The Haunting on Hill House because yeah. hers is also, I guess this doesn't really spoil it, but her story is also very much, you don't know if the narrator is actually encountering these supernatural things in the house or if she's imagining it. Yeah, that's kind of really what you get from the TV show as well. I mean, eventually they're definitely like, no, it's it's happening. It's <laughs> yeah, That's it's a ghost. A, yeah. Let's make a, we're doing a hard turn for. Hard yeah, turn. <laughs> yeah, into things are fucked. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of what you get though. But I'm, I'm really excited to see how they turn this into that TV show as well. I mean, because it'll probably, they, they're going to make it so that it's a ghost. Yep. <laughs> so I would like to see how they do that. Netflix. Yep. We're excited. I'm looking up all the literary reworkings too. Like the Secret Garden was influenced by it. Oh shit, yep. really? I mean, I kind of see that because I mean, I mean, just children being little shits. That's the Secret Garden. <laughs> Yeah. 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 And there's like some like sinister esque kind of portions yeah, with like the mystery. father. Yeah. The mystery of like just kind of death and everything in that. I love the secret garden. garden I growing up. also loved it. I, I read it, it many, many times. Yes. And I think the movies are good. Ooh, did you see that they're coming out with a new, um, I think it's a TV show. I don't know if it's for like Apple TV. Oh. Uh, but they're coming out with a secret garden TV show. Oh, really? Yeah. Aww. Or maybe like it remember- could be just a mini series, probably, or just a new film. I don't know. I don't do research. <laughs> it's something. It's out there. It is something. And then they're doing like an Emily Dickinson um, TV show for Apple TV as yeah. well, which is also interesting. But let's end this because yeah. this isn't a TV show. We'll podcast. wrap it up so you can get on with your day thinking about ghosts and yeah, and spooky radical stuff. experimentalism. Yes, exactly. All right. So you can find us on social media, Twitter and Instagram at Book and Bitch Podcast. Yep. Uh, you can find us on our website, www.bookandbitch.com. Yep. Jenny, where can they find you on the internet? They can find me on the Twitter and the Instagram at glcubel underscore rights or on my website, www.glcubel.com. Yes. And you can find me on the internet as well at raven underscore co-op or coop. Um, and at co-op the podcast. All right, Jenny, what's our final quote? Oh, no, I just shut my I laptop. Know. I saw I you forgot. do it. I was like, fuck. And you're like, stop it. How dare okay, you? Don't worry. I got it. Ready, okay. guys? Yes. I was so determined to have all of my proof that I flashed into ice to challenge him. Whom do you mean by he? Peter Quint, you devil. His face gave again round the room. It's convulsed supplication. Where? They are in my ear still, his supreme surrender of the name and his tribute to my devotion. What does he matter now, my own? What will he ever matter? I have told you, I launched at the beast, but he has lost you forever. Then, for the demonstration of my work, there, there, I said to Miles. But he had already jerked straight around, stared, glared again, and seen but the quiet day. Jeez, spooky. It is spooky. It is so spooky. All right. Oh. That's it. On that note, have a spooky day. Spooky day. Bye. Bye.